this is a different kind of thing that I usually do. If anyone remembers when I was reading One Piece, I did a lot of video reviews for that. And I want to kind of transition into doing videos for Talking About Wheel of Time because I just feel like I, I express myself better in videos. And especially because this book, I'm going to talk about Winter's Heart, the ninth book in Wheel of Time. I had an over two hour long conversation with a good friend of mine who had just finished it as well. Uh, and I, I really feel the need to talk about this and regurgitate unscripted some of the things that I said in it. Because unfortunately, as well as with Path of Daggers book eight, which no one cares, but I wrote a huge post about that as well. Um, there's a lot of negative discourse over this book in Path of Daggers. And I just don't get it. I don't see it. And frankly, it makes me pretty mad at a lot of the Wheel of Time uh, fandom and community for it. Like, it just comes off as sheer ignorance and frankly disrespect for Robert Jordan to say that these are boring books, which th that's like straight up wrong, uh, in my opinion. And especially with Winter's Heart, I think this is without a doubt one of the best Wheel of Time books that I've read so far. And um, as for why, well, a lot of payoff happens in this and especially many things that were set up in book two, The Great Hunt, which was already one of my favorite books. It's now been made even higher on my list of favorite books, like ever, period, Great Hunt, because just the, the amount that it set up without feeling like set up, like it was just very natural, uh, especially all the payoff in this book. For example, the revelation of the statues, the giant statues that were found in The Great Hunt, which are actually, uh, there's one here, and then there's one in the Shanchan lands. They are linked to uh, Sidene and Sidar, respectively, the male and female half of the One Power, or the True Source, whatever. I, I get confused sometimes. But um, that was an amazing payoff. And this was, I believe, Shadow Rising, where Matt gets his Daughter of the Nine Moons prophecy, we finally get the payoff of that. We finally meet the Daughter of the Nine Moons. Not only that, but we get to see Matt meet her. And at first, he doesn't know that it's her. And then he finds out. And it's an amazing scene where he just kind of spills his spaghetti. And he says, whoa, hold on. It's okay. That's my wife. And everyone's confused because they don't understand. Amazing. Like, And another thing is... Everyone complains about, and I complain too as well, of like White Cloaks, of um, Orgays, of Fael, what else, uh, Elida. Like these are the less interesting subplots and characters of Wheel of Time. There's barely any in this book. So like what is, like, look, it's short. Why are people complaining about that? Like people complain when there's White Cloaks and Shido and all that. And then now here's a book with barely, no White Cloaks at all, barely any Shido. People still complain. I, I, I just don't get it. I've even heard this book referred to as the Shido book. They're in, like, one or two chapters. Like, like is, is this a joke? Like, are people just... I, I'm starting to be convinced that the slog is just, like, a psyop gatekeep for people to, like, not want to get into Wheel of Time. They're like, oh, well, this 15-book series is great. Oh, but watch out, because books, sometimes they say 8 through 10, sometimes they say 7 through 10, which I loved 7. It was a little weak, but I thought it was a fantastic read still, just like, oh, gee, just like the rest of the series, because it's a fantastic series. Anyways, it just it just seems like a joke. Winter's Heart is amazing. It, we get to see Rand really in action. We see him executing these plans, and accomplishing an amazing amazing victory for him and for the whites like the ending of this book is masterpiece stuff it it literally like moved me to tears the first time mind you in this entire series nine books in this is the one that really made me get emotional it was one chapter it's a big chapter but it's one chapter and the amount of emotional payoff again the amount and it made sense as well it did not feel contrived i see even like reviewers that i like they they talk down on this book because they say not to call out mike or mike's book reviews i like him a lot but he did have this criticism i heavily disagree with where he said that this book makes the forsaken into a joke now that's a pretty big statement and there's actually truth to that the forsaken are a joke They've been a joke for a while, frankly, um, but especially in this book. Now, here's why that's okay. 
the Forsaken, Robert Jordan knows what he's doing, especially it's clear with how much, again, was set up in The Great Hunt, you know, book two, how much is set up. He's a great writer, and he understands how to craft a natural feeling story. The purpose of the Forsaken, the reason why they're so pathetic, and they're always not really accomplishing much, that's meant to show the incompetence of evil, right? And it's meant to show their hubris. They think that, oh, well, we're the Forsaken, we're the chosen ones of the Dark Lord, we don't have to try, right? Oh, the Dragon Reborn is just like a farm boy. And they could get owned because of that. They're not prepared. Now, you could argue, oh, but, you know, they killed Ravin, they killed Samael, like, seemingly killed Samael, they killed um, freaking Ishamael, like, the biggest Forsaken. Surely that should motivate them. Yes, but here's the thing. Robert Jordan is smart about that because then he introduces the infightings of the Forsaken, right? Big thing about Wheel of Time is strength in numbers. It's about bonds. It's about friendship. It's about, like, love, things like that. The Forsaken don't have that. They all hate each other. Again, showing how even in evil, right, evil corrupts itself as well. So you have, like, Ravin was extremely powerful, and he could have nearly killed Rand, and the reason why was because he acted on himself, and he actually tried, right? Then you have Samael, who Samael was just completely incompetent. He was lying to all the Forsaken. He was trying to make deals behind everyone's backs and ended up biting him in the ass later, right? So in Winter's Heart, we have this amazing climax where Rand links up with so many other people. He links up with Nynaeve. He links up with Alvina, who already is like one of the most powerful Aes Sedai, etc., and even the Ashaman, like Eben and the others, are helping. And the Forsaken are like, oh, shoot, like, he's actually going to do this. He's actually going to try to cleanse Sidene. So they all try to unite, but they're all separate. Because, again, none of them like each other. That is the point. Now, I think that, again, I don't know what's going to happen in the rest of this series. But I think that this battle, the battle near Shadow Logoth, I think that's what it's officially called, um... It's going to be a wake-up call to the Forsaken, I think. It's going to be them realizing, oh man, like, we got our asses handed to us. We need to step up. I think that this was purposeful. Like, the Dark One and Morden wanted this wake-up call for the other Forsaken. Because Morden clearly wanted the keys that Rand possessed. Um, and I don't think Morden could have cleansed Sidene himself. And frankly, I don't really know why he would really want to. Um... It, made, it just made me think that he wanted to protect them and actually wanted to help Rand do this. Because when he saved Rand and Shadow Logoth in the end of A Crown of Swords, he said, if you die here, that's going to really mess up my plans. So I think he wanted this to happen. He wanted this victory for Rand because he knew, and the Dark One by extension knew, that um, the Forsaken would just get whooped because they're being incompetent clowns that like don't like each other. Now they're going to actually try. Right, I think that because Morden just shows up out of nowhere, and no one knows who Morden is, but Morden has been declared nameless, and this is confirmed by uh, what's his name, Shatter Huron, the the Merdral that is basically in the mouth of Sauron from Lord of the Rings, but the equivalent for the Dark One. Anyways, he comes in and he's like, "Yo, this guy who says he's nameless, like he's actually nameless, and you got to listen to him and I because we are speaking for the Dark One." So. Even then, I feel like it would be hard for them to listen to that because, like, Samael thought he could be Nablus. Even Demondred is always like, oh, well, I, I could be Nablus too. But he never even does anything. And again, that's the point, right? So saying that as a criticism just is a slap in the face to Robert Jordan, making probably the most realistic and, like, natural-feeling plot progression and character progression I've ever experienced in a franchise. I was watching an interview... I think it was a, a specifically the 10th book, Crossroads of Twilight, um, where um, Robert Jordan talks about how he wanted the world and the story to develop through the perspective of the characters. And this is very different from the way Tolkien writes. Tolkien is a world builder, first and foremost. Robert Jordan... Honestly, not as great of a writer as Tolkien. Like, 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 if we're talking specifically about the linguistic side of creating writing and then writing it, it's not as good as Lord of the Rings. But Robert Jordan has the kind of possibly an edge on Tolkien in terms of character and plot development, right? Obviously, Will of Time is much larger than uh, Lord of the Rings. I think Eye of the World alone is almost as large as the Lord of the Rings, like as in the three books together, which is the way you should be reading it anyways. 
um, yeah, it's, it's, it's insane how different they are in terms of that. And Robert Jordan might not put a lot of effort into world building and lore, but what he does do is he grows, he makes the world grow through the eyes of the characters, right? The Emmons field, small cast of characters, farm people mostly. They don't know a lot of the world. Frankly, they don't even know that Morghese exists. Like Morghese is, even though it lies in her territory, she's so far removed that she doesn't even really pay attention to anything in the two rivers. So they go out into the world, that's Eye of the World. Eye of the World is a very simple Tolkien-esque fantasy. And then from there, the characters grow up, they become adults. You have to remember that they were teenagers at the beginning of the series. Now they're starting to develop their own sense of the world. They're starting to learn more about it and actually venture into it, right? They're all doing their own different things. Frankly, I will admit, Perrin's plot, like, sucks. I, I hate what's going on with Perrin. I'm sure it's going to pay off, but, like, man, it's a slog. That is a slog, I will admit. So, book 10 is apparently the Perrin book. If that's true, I can kind of imagine if this is a slog. But one book of 15, like, to me, that's not a slog, you know? People are just so over exaggerating, especially when like Winter's Heart is considered like the second worst Wheel of Time book. This is one of the best books in the series. And, and again, uh, I realize this is just turning into a rant, but um, this was just an amazing read to me. Like, it, it, I can't believe, in a sense, I can understand if you were uh, experiencing this as it came out. But I believe it was only like one to two years between books. It's not like George R. R. Martin, right, where he takes like these super long breaks. I mean, I think Robert Jordan did take breaks at some point, but I, I don't think it was with this book. Like, even then, it, you you get a lot of important plot stuff. You get one of the greatest endings in the whole series. Everything in Farm Modding as well is fantastic. It's such a great idea of a place where you cannot channel. You get Cad Suane stepping up and really proving herself to be this kind of new Moraine-type figure, right? You get the amazing scene where she negotiates for Rand's uh, release when he gets captured after he falls for Powder Fane's uh, trap. <sighs> I don't even know who's going to watch this, um, but I just needed to get that message out there for anyone who's interested in this series, please. I mean, again, I can't speak for Crossroads of Twilight or Crossroads in Twilight, whatever. I can't speak for that, right? I'm just started. I'm still in the prologue, but people who say books seven, eight, and nine are songs, no, they're not, okay? I could make videos like this for books seven and eight as well. Now, I have criticisms of seven and eight. Uh, primarily that Seven's plot is a little too loose, loosely connected, and then Eight's, the first half is, besides the Bowl of the Winds plot paying off, kind of slow and not much happens. That second half is amazing. And anyone who says that Eight's ending sucks, you have to understand that a lot of Eight's second half is more of like an epilogue, right? Uh, of the big battle that Rand has with the Shan Chan, and then you deal with the fallout after that, which is a very important thing. And you can't have that like tacked in to the beginning of this book, because then that screws everything up. Oh, by the way, this book's prologue, amazing. The Olaine and Avienda uh, sister ritual, I forgot what it's called. Um, one of the best segments in the whole series. Like, it's so emotional and so powerful and so, like, funny as well. This this book definitely has more humor than most Wheel of Time books, especially when it comes to Matt. Now, I still don't like that Matt is getting toyed around with with Tywin. Don't like that at all. I hope the only thing that I would make that plot okay for me is if, like, okay, this might be a little spoiler, but basically Matt's become, like, a sex slave to this Queen Tywin, and this is in Ebu Dar, and during this time in Ebu Dar, Matt's getting stalked by uh, this creature called a Ghulam, which is basically, it looks like a man, but he can kind of mold himself into any shape, he can squeeze through cracks and stuff, and he's made a personal vendetta against Matt, because Matt's Silver Fox Medallion is the only thing that can actually hurt him, like, not even Aes Sedai channeling can hurt the Ghulam, they were made purposefully to counter Aes Sedai and channelers. So, for some reason, Matt's Silver Fox Medallion works. So, the Ghulam encounters Matt again, he fought him in Crown of Swords, is it Crown of Swords? Path of Daggers, oh, I forgot. I think it's Crown of Swords, he fights him. Then uh, he encounters him again, and uh, the Ghulam is basically like, oh, I think I think this happens in Path of Daggers, actually. The Ghulam basically is like, I'm going to get you, right? And he squeezes away. That's my cat in the background. So the only thing that can make the Talon plot pay off is if, like, 
he thinks that Ty, the Ghulam thinks that Tywin is like close to Matt because like he sees them having sex a lot and stuff, and he's like always in her bed. And then the Ghulam like, squeezes into her room and then just like kills her. That'd be the only reason why I would like in this entire Ebudar plot with Matt. That's the only reason. I don't think that's gonna happen because Matt's already um, moving out of Ebudar. Spoilers for this book. Um, by the way, the, the way that Matt's plot ended in this was so good with like Tuan. I, I kind of talked about it already, but Matt realizing that Tuan is his future wife, so good. I, I'm very interested in Tuan's character. Um, Okay, I'm kind of rambling now, but that's that's I just needed to get my thoughts out there on Winter's Heart. PSA, if you want to get into this series, don't listen. This is not a slog. For those of you that do like this series, if you say that this is a slog, why? I, I don't understand. Um, if you are following that camp, I'm willing to hear you out. Um, I don't want to be too antagonistic, but I do frankly think that it is kind of disrespectful to Robert Jordan to think that but if you have any insights or anything, just please keep it spoiler-free. I'm relatively spoiler-free with this series, and I'm very excited to continue.